Well, good morning. Good morning, Walden Church. Thank you so much for coming out once again. Thank you for being here. We are in the middle of looking at a sermon series about Joseph, and we're calling this series Dream On because Joseph is a dreamer. He's a dreamer. And we see that manifesting in his life in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first is that God has a large dream, a God-sized dream for Joseph's life, and that is to save everyone, right? Joseph knows that one day he'll save everyone, he'll save his people, he will save Egypt. The second is Joseph has a gift and that he can interpret dreams. He is able to listen to someone's dream, and then the Holy Spirit is able to translate for Joseph what God is saying. Last week, we watched as Joseph interpreted the dream of the cook and the cupbearer. Both worked for Pharaoh. Both had weird dreams on the same night, and Joseph was able to tell each of them what the dreams meant, most notably the cupbearer, he said, was going to get his old job back. He'd be back in the presence of Pharaoh. And then Joseph said to him, hey, when you get out, can you do me a favor? Can you put in a good word for me? Don't forget about me. And then what do we see takes place in the Bible? Genesis chapter 40, verse 23, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And then if you turn one page, if you go from Genesis 40 to Genesis 41, the very first words at the top of the page in Genesis 41 say, after two whole years. After two whole years. It's, I, I, after two years, <laughs> I think you'd start to say to yourself, you know, I don't think that guy's coming back, right? That's, that's 730 days. And the Bible is silent through this whole time. The Bible just says, two years go by, right? It, it doesn't say what happens. There's no recorded events. There's just drudgery. There's just jail for two years. Monotony. The same day, today, just like it was yesterday. No visitors, no going out, just us locked up behind a door for what feels like eternity. Gee, I wonder what that feels like. So why did it take so long? I mean, if God has a plan for Joseph's life, why did it take so long? Why does God wait to answer prayer? Last week we said, God is still at work. God is at work even when we don't see it. He is at work sometimes behind the scenes. It may be behind the scenes in my life, maybe behind the scenes in someone else's life, but it feels like we send up a prayer and nothing comes back down. God is still working behind the scenes even when we don't see anything happening. In John chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said to his critics, my father is always at his work. To this very day, I too am working. So God is working. And Joseph is sitting, standing, repeating, right? This is what he does. I mean, he's working, but he's working in a jail. And the Bible says two years go by with nothing exciting, nothing to record, nothing eventful taking place. Do you know how long Noah was in, was in the ark? Not how long it rained, mind you, that's not what I'm talking about, but from the moment he went into the boat when it was on dry ground to the moment he left the boat on dry ground. That was a year. A year! So, so what's the truth? Sometimes God makes us wait, right? God makes us wait. Have you ever experienced that? before? A time when God has you in a period of waiting. 
and it seems like nothing is going on, right? Is heaven closed for cleaning? I, I, I call and I just it goes straight to voicemail and I wonder, is, is something going on up there? Is, is anyone listening to me up there? Have you ever taken a taxi or an Uber and you wondered why? Why did the driver choose that street over that street? Like, why didn't he go that direction and not that direction? Do you know what that's called? It's called backseat driving, right? <laughs> we do it in cars because we wonder, what is the driver thinking? You know, can't, can't they see all those brake lights up ahead? Everybody else is slowing down. You know, if, if she moved just one lane over, she, right now, she'd be more prepared to make her turn. We're not driving, so we get a little antsy because from where we're sitting, it looks like nothing is happening. It looks like no action is taking place, but the reality is things are happening, things that we're not even aware of. And we backseat drive at the job, at the workplace. And I don't know why corporate doesn't do this, this, and this. Their company would sure run a lot better. We backseat drive at church. We should sing these songs. We should do these studies. We should spend our money this way. We backseat drive sports teams, right? Why did they just trade that guy? He's their best hitter. Why is that guy always on the bench? We backseat drive our government. This is the best way to lead the country. No, this is the best way to lead the country. No, this is the best way to lead the country. Everyone has an opinion. And we think ours is the best. And we wonder if the powers that be are doing anything or if they even think or consider the things that I think about. But we assume that they don't. What about God? Do we backseat drive God? Why did God do it that way? Why doesn't God do it this way? Why did God say this? Why did God create this? Why did God take this away from me? Why did God make me like this? Why is the world like this? Why are people like this? Do you know what the answer is to the why question with God? I mean, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the answer. Because he's perfect. <laughs> why did God do that? Because he's perfect. Are you perfect? I'm not. So I won't be able to understand it. Probably. Isaiah chapter 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Do you know what that means? It means perfection is out of our reach. It's out of our sight. It's out of our understanding. It's almost unattainable. I mean, will you ever understand why? Probably not. Psalm 1830 says, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. So what are we learning? God is always at work and He's perfect. God is always at work and he's perfect. Knowing that, knowing that, I don't want to ever question God again. Right? I mean, he doesn't need my advice. He doesn't need my counsel. We could say, God, why is this happening to me? To you, God would say, this is all for you, right? Everything 
I do, including sending my own son to die, has been for you because he is perfect. Chuck Swindoll says, all whom God uses greatly are first hidden in the secret of his presence. And it's times, I think, that when we feel alone and abandoned and left and forgotten and in jail, that it's possible that the reality is we're actually being established. We're being perfected. We're being refined. We're being shaped for God's greatness. And this is exactly what's happening to Joseph right now. Maybe in the waiting, it's the time for us to grow. It's the time for us to mature. Or maybe like Noah, we're waiting for the things on the outside to clear up. We're waiting for the perfect opportunity. But make no mistake that as we wait, our perfect God is still working. So let's pick up our story with Joseph back at Genesis chapter 41. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive plump cows, and Pharaoh awoke. And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, and there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. So here's another example. Here's another example of imperfect people trying to understand why things are happening. Pharaoh has a dream this time, right? It's not the cupbearer, it's not the cook, it's Pharaoh this time. He has a dream, he has a nightmare. He has two nightmares, he has a nightmare and then he has a sequel, right? And he wakes up knowing This is not your typical dream, he says to himself. This is not just the I forgot my homework at school dream. So he calls all of his local scholars. Now, these would be council members and scientists and wizards who are all employed by the kingdom to do exactly this sort of thing. And typically, when this is your job, and you're employed by a tyrant, right, who uh, could say at any time or, or throw you into jail at any time if you displease him, just like we saw with the cook and the cupbearer, that if you don't know the answer, it's probably in your best interest to just make something up, right? Just lie. He's not going to know, right? Just make something up. Pharaoh won't know. But the scriptures say these guys couldn't even lie. They just shrugged their shoulders and said, we give up. Now, is Pharaoh the kind of person that's used to hearing no, to not getting what he wants? Probably not. Somebody had better think of something and fast. Verse 9 says, Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me with the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office and the baker 
was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when they had shaved him and changed his clothes, he was brought before Pharaoh. Now, after two years, right, two years of waiting from when the cupbearer left, 10 to 12 years altogether in jail, no bath, no shave, it might be a little jarring to be finally released, to have people notice you again, to have people talk to you again. But let's make something perfectly clear. From the very first day that Joseph went into that prison, God was already working on a plan to get him out. In fact, God knew the exact moment Joseph would get out. The very first Sunday that our church closed the doors on a Sunday because of COVID, we had no idea what day we would all come back. But God did. And when it seemed like each day was dragging into the next and, and even now, you know, we're watching weekly statistics and wondering when this is all going to be over, when life will go back to normal. God knows. God knows. A very similar story about prison, about jail, about getting out of jail. The Apostle Peter also spent some time in prison. The Bible has his story in Acts chapter 12. Verse 6 says, On that very night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and centuries before the door, guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Same thing, same thing. Peter has no advance warning, probably thinks he's going to be in jail for a while, and an angel wakes him up by kicking him in the ribs and saying, get dressed, we're leaving, right? And then the Bible says it happens all so fast, Peter can't even tell if he's still dreaming. Has God forgotten us? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's been a long time. It doesn't matter. Has God forgotten us? No. How do we know? Because he's always working. What's our job? What should I be doing? The same thing we've been saying since the first day we started studying Joseph. And that is what? Be patient. Be patient. Thomas Fuller said, all commend patience, but none can endure to suffer. A.W. Tozer said, it is doubtful that God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Have you ever wondered if patience and suffering go hand in hand? If you agree with me, it might mean that you still have kids in your house. Have you ever seen what happens to a child when you tell them that they have to wait? We'll do that tomorrow. We'll get to that later. Yes, we'll do that, but not today. What happens? They fall apart, right? It's the end of the world. But am I any better? We, we, say, we say patience is a virtue, right? Absolutely. But ask me to suffer while I wait? Ugh. Sign me out. Joseph is patient for two more years, over 10 years in prison, because he hasn't given up on God. And he knows that God hasn't given up on him. Verse 15, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, and there's no one who can interpret it. 
I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Can you read that confidence? That's incredible. I'm sorry, but over 10 years in prison, I don't know that my first day out in the sunlight, I'd be defending God, right? I think the average person would be a little bitter. Not Joseph. Verse 17. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream, I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears, withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind, spouted after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it all to the magicians, but there is no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that come up after the seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them there will arise seven years of famine. And in all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years, and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming, and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities, and let them keep it, that food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish through the famine. And so here, right here, this is where it's going to happen. This is where the whole story has been pointing and leading up to. Here is where we are going to see all of Joseph's dreams come true. Verse 37. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this, in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all of this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. This is the story of Potiphar all over again, right? It's retold, only this time it's not second in charge of Potiphar's estate, it's second in charge of all of Egypt. He, he was a long, bearded, smelly prisoner just hours before this. And now, he is nobility. Pharaoh says, can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? God's presence is so indwelling in Joseph that a pagan king notices. Remember, it was the same thing with Potiphar right? Potiphar saw Joseph work and saw that God was with him. And just like that, the God-sized dream for Joseph comes true. It's fulfilled. All of Joseph's prayers are answered. His plan is realized. Joseph was patient, and the dream came true. And look, if this were just Joseph's plan, could Joseph have planned for this outcome. Never in a million years. 
Could Joseph have reached this goal on his own? Achieved this plan by his own power? No way! Isn't it so much better when God takes over? Isn't it better when God is driving the car and we're in the back seat? Can you imagine if Joseph had tried to backseat drive his own life, to wrestle the steering wheel away from God? Do you even know what you're doing up there, God? Why are you doing it like this? Because God is always at work and his work is perfect. Verse 41 says, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck and he made him ride in his second chariot. And they called out before him, Bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Joseph got a lot of really expensive, really important gifts right there. I mean, do you know what a signet ring is? You know what that is? It's basically the centurion card from American Express. What's special about the centurion card? It has no preset spending limit, and it gives you access to a personal concierge who can fulfill any request that you can dream of. It also offers luxury perks, uh, exclusive treatment at the best airport lounges, uh, world-class surprise gifts, advanced reservations at over a thousand of the world's best restaurants, and a suite of luxury travel benefits. How do you get one? It's invitation only. A signet ring is your stamp to get in anywhere and to do anything by order of Pharaoh. No questions asked. Oh, and he also gets a gold necklace, right? A whole new wardrobe. He got a chariot, so company car. And if you read past verse 45, they even give him a wife. Not bad for a guy who woke up that morning a scruffy, ragged and forgotten prisoner. What's the good news? The good news is that when God determines it's the right time, this is how he works. Did you ever wonder what was going through Joseph's mind right about now? I hope he was saying, wow, thank you, God. I am so unworthy, but wow, God, you have totally blown me away. I have no idea what lessons Joseph learned in prison. The Bible never says. Those years in jail are summed up so briefly. But knowing Joseph and what he's had to go through perhaps we can extrapolate our own lessons. First and foremost, I would say, don't panic. Don't panic. Last week, we said the cupbearer forgot Joseph. But in truth, it just took him two more years to remember, two years to wait till the right moment. And we see that same kind of story play out in the book of Esther. She learns of a plot against her own people. And even though she's married to the king, right? She's his wife. She still knows that to approach him with an idea or request when the king did not summon her, when he did not ask her, that could have been a death sentence. She says in Esther 4, 6, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. That means should she die, her own life, she is forfeiting. She is going as 
Yes, his wife, but to make a request. Can you imagine how the cupbearer would have felt? He had to wait. He had to wait for the right moment. He had to wait for the perfect moment. God has not forgotten you. Don't panic. God has not abandoned you. Don't panic. The, the dream for your life, the plan for your life is on track right now. So just be patient. Don't panic. Be patient. And second, give thanks. When it all comes to fruition, give thanks for the blessing. The only way you're ever going to get out of the ark, <laughs> the only way you're ever going to get out of jail is if God gets you out. Right? You can't do it on your own. Right now you might feel like you're trapped in a leaky, creaky boat with smelly animals, two very loud and smelly animals, <laughs> adorable animals, though they are. <laughs> or you might feel like you're locked up in the same place with no end in sight, but for all you know, there is liberation right outside the door and they're holding a, a can of shaving cream and the keys to the company car. So when that happens and God sets you free, remember that you didn't do it. Nobody did it. Nobody on earth made that happen. You were set free by God. In fact, that was the main purpose of Jesus when he was here on earth. In his own mission statement, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, curing disease, helping people to walk, feeding people, curing blindness, raising the dead. Those are all moments where Jesus broke the chains of oppression. He removed the prison doors. He removed people who were bound and gave them freedom. But that was all outward. That was all physical, tangible, things that they could see. And the people loved him for the physical freedom that he brought. They loved him even more for the spiritual freedom. They loved him even more for the forgiveness and the grace that he brought. That's told so eloquently in Luke chapter 5. It says, on one of those days as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. These helpful friends have heard that Jesus can heal and give freedom back to those who cannot walk. And they are hoping for a physical miracle, just like Joseph sitting in jail. He wants to get out. He wants to see the sun again, maybe get a job at Burger King, right? He's got a super simple plan. It's not going to take much to make him happy at this point. But when Jesus sets people free, he brings shaving cream and keys to the company car. Verse 20 says, and when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sin but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? In other words, which statement proves that I am God? Which one? 
Wh which, which of these tasks is more difficult? Which of these tasks is harder? Because you said it yourself. You said it yourself. Only God can forgive sin. Yes, we all long to be set free, and that would make us happy. But what we crave more than anything is forgiveness. Listen, only God can get you out of the dungeon. His tender mercies are available to you this morning. That dry spell, that hard time, that deep hurt that you are experiencing, it may just be God's beginnings of a plan starting to take shape. You can be set free. You can feel what it's like to have the shackles come off and to receive forgiveness. Here at Walden Church, we believe that freedom is as simple as ABC. First, you admit. Admit that you are a sinner. Romans 3 says, all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. There's no shame in admitting that you're a sinner. There's no shame in admitting you're not perfect or that you can't do life alone. Our church is a place of people who have already admitted that they don't want to do life alone. A church is a family. It's a family that's made up of people who are imperfect and who are broken and who are hurting. But it's a family that believes in Jesus. Acts 4.12 says there is no salvation by anyone else and there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we can be saved. Do you believe that Jesus stands ready to offer you life? Do you believe that a life of following Jesus is better than a life without him? If that's true, the Bible says that the only thing you have to do is to confess it. Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Belief and admission. Those are the cornerstones of salvation. It's not about how good you are. It's not about how much you give. It's not about how long you've been saved or how much you're trying to be perfect. We're not saved by anything that we do. We are not set free from the prison by anything that we do, right? We don't save ourselves. We are only saved by what Christ did on the cross. And if that sounds like the life you want, if that sounds like freedom, if that sounds like the life you've always wanted, then I would invite you to bow your heads and pray this prayer. Jesus, I am a sinner. Thank you for coming to rescue me from a life of sin. I want to live my life following you. And so I put my trust in you as my Lord and Savior to follow you and to live the way you would have me live. Thank you for setting me free. And thank you for the gift of eternal life. Amen. I would say that if you prayed that prayer, don't keep it a secret. Tell another Christian. Tell someone in your family. Tell someone you know at work. Tell someone at church. Tell me. Give someone the opportunity to welcome you into the family and to begin to start to hold you accountable and to maybe answer some questions that you have. You've got questions. You want to know what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I would invite you to go deeper in your faith by reaching out to a local community of believers at any church and begin to become involved and to serve and to find out what it means to follow Jesus all the days of your life. 
Thank you for coming out. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here on YouTube and experiencing this or being here in church uh, with us all together. We thank you for your presence. Of course, this file is available as a podcast, as MP3. It's also available as a video on YouTube. Please take the link, clip and copy it, post it to your own wall, post it to a friend's wall that you think uh, might need to hear this message. I love you guys so much. I miss you guys every single day. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.